Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. If you don't know me already, my name is John Arnold and I'm the pastor here at the Presbyterian Church in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas. Super excited about having you in worship today because we're going to be diving into a critical topic that everyone needs to understand and some biblical truths around it. Specifically, what I'm talking about is we're going to be looking at the conscience and how do we have, how do we take care of and have a clear conscience? The Bible has some awesome things to say about this. And if you're ready for your conscience to be freed up, then you are in the right place. Now, to prepare ourselves to receive God's word, let's slow down, bring our hearts and minds together as we listen to a lovely prelude this morning played by Barrett Kelly. join me in the uh, call to worship. Thank you. The Lord offered himself so that our conscience can be free from all things that lead to death. Let us freely go and worship the living God. In our opening hymn, you may not recognize that title, but I think you'll recognize the tune. The tune is from Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. So it's a very common, common tune. I invite you now to stand and sing with me our opening hymn, number 260, Alleluia, Alleluia Sing to Jesus.
dig into God's Word. And once I get done with the lessons that are in the bulletin, you might want to hang on to it. There's a couple passages not in the bulletin that I'll lift up. Sometimes it's helpful to have it in front of you if you're a visual learner. So I wouldn't tuck that Bible away too quickly. But before we look at God's Word, let's join together in prayer. Holy God, as we open up your Holy Word... It is a living word. It can speak new to us every day, this day not being an exception. And to that end, we pray. We ask that your Holy Spirit would anoint us, that we would hear and see with great understanding. And also, Lord, that as I preach that what I would be lifting up, it's right, it's true, it's fitting to what you intended by your word so that I do not distort its meaning and lead us astray. To that end, Lord, I ask the anointing of your Spirit as well. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, we're going to start by looking at Psalm 146. It's a praise psalm. I invite you to join with me in the Pew Bibles. Listen now to God's holy word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes and mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers, he upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. And then we're also reading from Hebrews 9 this morning. That's really the passage that I'll be focused on as I preach. I invite you to follow along. And we're in the ninth chapter beginning at the 11th verse. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctify those who have been defiled, so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God? For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, because a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. The word of the Lord. So, if we were to back up and look earlier in Hebrews, what we'd find is most of this book, and particularly right before this, the author's making a case for Jesus being kind of a superlative system. Jesus is a new and better covenant. His sacrifice is is a better sacrifice. He is a priest unlike any priest who's come before. And he's taking everything that they knew and understood about how to interact and relate to God, and he's kind of standing it on their heads, on its head. Now, I really want to focus in on this near the bottom of this where it talks about purify purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. That Jesus purifies our conscience conscience. I think we can have a lot of misunderstanding about what conscious is, what our conscious is, is or what it isn't, and also the role it plays in our lives and where Jesus fits in it. So we're going to kind of unpack that. I mean, we all know that we have a conscience, and, and 
it hap- even in the littlest child, they have an inherent sense of right and wrong. Frequently, they just know they're in trouble before they know they're in trouble, right? You know, like they, they'll start hiding before anybody's told them what they did was wrong. And it may be something they've never done before, but something stirs in them and they feel and they know in their heart of hearts that they're wrong and that something is not right. It's, it's a mechanism that God has put in us and it is not something that comes necessarily with believing, but it's part of our human nature. And the reason I say that is if we were to look in the book of Romans, you know, I said there would be some passages, we, some other passages we'd look at. If we look in the book of Romans chapter 12, verses 14 through 16, or I said 12, 2, 2, 14 through 16, we hear this uh, about the conscience, if you will, says, all who have sinned apart from the law, meaning people who are Gentiles, is who the author of Romans talk about, all who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now here's where I want you to really pay attention. When Gentiles who do not possess the law In other words, they don't have a list of what's right and wrong before them. They don't have what God has said is right and wrong. Do instinctively what the law requires. These, though not these, though not having the law, are law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts, to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. I want you to notice in that. He's talking about people who are not part of the church. They're not part, they were not part of God's family pre-covenant with Jesus, the, the Israelites. These were folks who were considered basically godless people. And what that word is saying is that Written on their hearts is the essence of what is right or wrong, and the conscience will reveal it to them. Now, here's the problem. We've probably, many of you maybe had parents who said, let your conscience be your guide. Or you've heard that, right? Let your conscience be your guide. That's sort of okay instruction. The problem is, is that our conscience can be miscalibrated. It's an instrument. It is a tool that God has put in us as human beings so that we can know right and wrong and go through life, hopefully avoiding a lot of needless hardship. The problem is, is that that tool can be corrupted. And when it is, we can be then pointed in the right direction. And I'm sure you've met people before and said, Man, does that guy not have a conscience? They can do something that just seems horrifically wrong and yet feel no sense of conviction about it at all. Well, what happens is, is that our conscience, the word that Scripture uses for it, can become seared. I'm going to look at another passage here real quickly. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3 says a word about the conscience as well. That was 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3 says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter time, later times, some will renounce the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They forbid marriage, demand abstinence from fruit, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, nothing's to be rejected, provided it's received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by God's word and by prayer. The important part of this passage is where it talks about they, they renounce their faith because they've been paying attention to these other spirits. They've been paying attention to these other things. And then what happens is, it's like they do a rewrite of the law that's on their hearts, right? The conscious is just going to give testimony 
to what moral code we are already carrying. Let me repeat that. The conscience is just going to give testimony to whatever moral code we're already carrying. I'll take this outside a moral spectrum, and I'll give you kind of a parallel, um, a, a parallel analogy here. Let's look at the law law. Like, there is, there is the law that the government has, and there are speed limits, right? There are speed limits out there. But what is your internal speed limit when you're on the highway? Yeah, what, what, what does, like, do you have a, do you have, have you recalibrated that internally to be five above is okay, nine above is okay, ten above is okay? Like, what is your, what is your recalibration of the law in your heart, right? You can clip along at five, ten above and feel no pang of consciousness whatsoever, but be completely skewed of the law. Why? because you have reset the moral parameter within your heart despite what the law says, right? We can do the same thing with God's law. And as a result, it's almost like we just disable the speedometer. You know, the conscience is supposed to be there to go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 you're going too fast. But we disable that thing or we miscalibrate it to where it doesn't go off when it should. Because it's like we've just rewritten the operating system. How many of you have ever had, um, I've, I've had a situation where my GPS, I've had a setting off in it, and it completely misguided me, just because I had a setting off. Perfectly good instrument. That's like the conscience. It's a good instrument. But if the settings are wrong, it won't matter. <laughs> you know? You'll just continue along in a trajectory that's going to wind up being disastrous. So we have to be careful about our conscience being our guide. That's fine and dandy as long as we have been perpetually pouring ourselves into the Word and positioning ourselves before God and experiencing the Holy Spirit so that the law within our hearts is correct. Because if that thing's off, even if our conscience is working really well, it's going to be misguided. And it's going to say, oh, you're fine. Well, no, you're fine because you've been telling yourself all these little lies that have monkeyed with the operating system. And now, it's like you've disabled the fail-safe. You know? It's like, uh, I remember when if they first started making seatbelts beep all the time. People buckle them behind their seat, you know, or do all kinds of crazy stuff so they would, you know, perfectly working sensor, but you bypassed it. You bypassed it. And we can do that with the conscience. Um, they had, and what, what, this, what this is saying is, like your conscience, Jesus came to cleanse the consciousness. Jesus came to reset the whole system, if you will. Because we have all these other things we can start paying attention to. Or get in our own little operating system, install it, and start paying attention to that, and think we're just fine. He's like, no, Jesus is just wiping all that out and rewriting it. I was having a really hard time trying to relate to this passage because it's this, all, all this Old Testament kind of Levitical stuff, right? We don't have to deal with slaughtering animals and sprinkling ash and bulls and all this stuff that they that they did to be free of sin that he's talking about. And man, there was a protocol to it. You know, that when he talks about the priest, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but the priest would go in once a year to absolve the people of their sins, if they will, and he was the only one who could go into the Holy Holies, and he only went once a year. And it's actually said in some texts outside of Scripture, some, Tumel, some Talmudic texts, that it was such a fearful thing, they were so terrified, nobody else could go in there, that they would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest so that if something happened into him or when he gazed upon God and died, they could pull his body back out without having to go into the Holy of Holies because no one was supposed to go in there. And so they had all these elaborate rituals and I was trying to think, like, I was, how can I get in a mindset to understand what a release it must have been for them for Jesus to have fulfilled all that and suddenly none of it is necessary. All this 
elaborate ritual system. And here's what hit me. I was trying to think, what is this like? And I thought about when we went into pandemic mode and suddenly we had all these rituals of purification that came into our lives, right? Suddenly, in order to stay well, we had new language. We had social distancing that we had never even thought about. We'd run up and hug everybody and shake hands and whatnot. And then sanitizer everywhere and anywhere, at every door, every bathroom, all over the place, carrying it in our cars, clipped on your purse, whatever, sanitizer all over the place that we never even thought about carrying. Um, washing our hands. I remember the very early days of the pandemic. Sound like, you know, like these old people reflectors. <laughs> Back in the early days of people coming up with hand washing songs. I never had one of those. Like, what's your hand wash? What was your hand wash? Jolene? <laughs> I love it. Did anybody else have a hand washing song? I, did you? Okay, I didn't have one of those. But, but you know, so you made sure you washed long enough. We never did that stuff before. And then suddenly we started closing down and we had these quarantines and only certain people could do certain things. And I thought, you know what? That's kind of what they were living under, this complex code of rules and regulations to make sure nobody got sick, basically, right? That sin would not afflict them or that if it did afflict them, then you went into quarantine. You know, <laughs> like if sin hit, this is what we do. And we had this whole protocol I remember our household went into it. Susan got, got the vid, you know, got COVID, and all of a sudden it's like locking down the middle of the house. And you, well, I'll use the kitchen here and use it then and make sure you wipe down the cabinets. Be sure you do this, you know, and all this hyper protocol. You know, you were there in a split house of people sick and well. And, and I thought, just a minute. I, I remember how much there was a lot of relief, and we still have angst, and we still have debate over vaccine, not vaccine, all kinds of stuff around that. But there was also a lot of relief and release when a vaccine came along. Um, and in some ways, I think the priests were intended to be the vaccine, if you will. They were the ones who, you know, like they were to come in and, and, and they were going to take and sort of set, reset the system, if you will, to make sure everything was going to be okay. But the problem was, like our vaccines, it has to be done again and again and again. Now we've got people who, several of you I know, have gotten your booster shot. We're on like round three. They're saying some folks, if you're immunocompromised, go get round four, you know. What Jesus did is he didn't, he wasn't just sort of like the vaccine for sin. He just eradicated it. I mean, imagine if instead of getting announced that there was a vaccine, that suddenly there just was no COVID at all. Like, it just didn't exist. That for all practical purposes, who cares? It doesn't matter at all. And we were back to not a new norm, but back to what we knew as norm. Right? Man, that I can wrap my head around. That's what was going on for those Israelites with Jesus. He came in and it was like, it's, it's like God was saying, you know what? All of that stuff you've been doing, completely unnecessary. I've done it all. I've done it all. Let go of that. And let me cleanse your consciousness. The pro your conscience. The problem was, is that all of that hand washing and all of that sacrifice and all of that ritual it sort of outwardly took care of the problem. It was like us trying to hold things at bay by keeping the outer body clean. But it didn't take care of the virus within of sin for them. It did not eliminate that. Jesus eliminated that. Completely removed it as a problem. Which reoriented their whole lives of how they understood faith. And that, so how does that happen? That, clear, that cleansing of consciousness, that cleansing of consciousness comes when we can finally come before God, truly owning and understanding the brokenness of us and our need for cleansing. When we can pour out before God the pain and the guilt of what we carry and that we really earnestly hold and know that in our hearts and reveal it before God. I mean, I say reveal it. 
God sees it and knows it. It's more like we fess up. You know, we finally fess up to it and say, I need you. I need your help. I heard one story. I was listening to multiple sermons on this passage, and I heard one pastor, Scottish pastor. I wish, wish I had a Scottish bro, guys. Preaching would be so much better. But, <laughs> but I was listening to this guy, and he told a story of a pastor who went, and he was doing evangelism on a campus, and there was a young woman, just hard as nails woman in terms of um, any bad behavior you could think of, or she just threw herself unreservedly into it, and everybody knew it, and she knew it, and she wore it like a badge of honor. Just what a tough, you know, out on the edge human being she was. And at one of the services this pastor preached, afterwards she came up to him, and she walked up, stood there for a minute, took a long drag on her cigarette. I gave my heart to Christ tonight. Took another long drag. Walked away. <laughs> the pastor said, we'll see. That remains to be seen. And she showed up a couple nights later, and he actually didn't recognize her at first because her entire demeanor, it wasn't an external thing, her entire demeanor had changed. And... She came up to him afterwards and she said, you know, as tough as I appeared, I felt guilty as hell for everything I was doing. Her conscience was seared. And she, she said, I've spent almost the entire last day in tears over who I have been. That's when cleansing of consciousness occurs. When we come to that place where we earnestly earn, uh, earnestly own what we have done before God. We'll do things boldly before people, but we'll do them even more boldly before God because we think no one's looking. We talked about that a little bit in Sunday school. It's easy to put on an appearance but appearances, you can keep the outside clean all day long, but it's going to eventually catch up with you. At some point, there has to be a cleansing of heart. And that's what Christ, that's the work that Christ does for us. Praise be to God, we have that. And we don't have to just scramble in works nonstop trying to appease a God. But we have a God who loves us despite who we are and what we do. Praise be to God for that. Let's pray. Holy God, we thank you so much for grace. You know, we can, we can become so misguided so quickly. We internalize a small half-truth, which is a whole lie at the end of the day. We internalize a small half-truth, and then we start building on that and building on that and building on that until our conscience... It, it gets to a place where it's no longer reading right. The settings are all wrong. And we may be listening to it, but it may be at that point misguiding us. God, though, if we slow down and we listen deeply, somewhere beneath those half-truths we've layered on our hearts, somewhere deep, deep within our heart, is the law written indelibly? We've spent several weeks in a series called Busy, Reconnecting with an Unhurried God. It's in that reconnection that we get to a place of stillness and quiet, O oh God, where we can hit a system reset. And the way to get rid of all of those half-truths is to come before you with them and just fess up and say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, all messed up, needing help, needing you. And in that moment, Lord, cleanse our conscience so that we might serve, so that we might worship, so that we might honor you. We love you, Lord, and we want to give you honor 
in all that we do, in thought, word, and deed. To that end, we pray this morning. We also come before you, God, as a family of believers, and humbly, humbly and mindfully, we lift up to you words that Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now is time for us to honor God through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I would invite you to be generous because God is so generous to us. It is both a statement of thanks and it's a statement of our faith too. When we offer over a portion of what we have to God, it's, in a way it's saying, God, I know you're going to be there and provide enough. So it's a faith statement as well. Holy God, thank you so much for all your gifts to us. The things that we see, the monetary things, the physical things that come into our lives, the things unseen, the blessings that still uh, restlessness in our heart, uh, the moments of gratitude that wash over us, all these little unseen things that you do. We give you thanks for them, and today as we offer back a portion of what we've received, we ask your blessing upon it, that it might be a blessing to others, that they may know the, the love, the grace that you have available for them in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. We'll go forth this week with a grateful heart. That you don't have to mess with all those sacrifices because <laughs> that work has all been done through Jesus Christ. And let may God clean your conscience this week. I hope you take a moment to just bow your knee and be open hearted before God that He might do that work within you. And as you do so, may the love of God, the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ abide upon you abundantly now and forever. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.